In my journey of building a custom embedded device, namely a router, a lot of you have been very vocal when it comes to what kind of features you want and today I'd like to lock it down, so to speak. From this video forward, they are unlikely to change much, if at all, so let's discuss which features we decided to add based on your feedback and which one we decided to leave out. If you're just here for the too long didn't read version, here are the features and the CPU that supports them. Two 10 gigabit SFP plus ports, three gigabit RJ45 jacks, one of which may become a 2.5 gigabit jack, more on that towards the end of the video. And finally, three USB type C ports, each serving a different purpose. One for power delivery, second for what is called a UART, and finally the third one as your standard USB port, which is also known as a host port. We're not sure about the POE yet, so we'll chalk that up as a maybe and leave it as a last feature to be implemented if we have enough time, money and if it doesn't add up too much to the final cost of the device. It'll also have 8 gigabytes of discrete RAM, yes, it is enough, in fact, it's more than enough for a device like this. And apart from the RAM, it'll also have 64 gigabytes of discrete NAND flash, along with a micro SD slot, should you wish to add more storage. And finally, we'll put an M.2 slot on the PCB itself, because initially there won't be any Wi-Fi support, but we don't want to completely close that door, so to speak. Now, let's talk about the CPU. To drive all these features, we've chosen an ARM CPU called Layerscape LS1046A, designed by a company called NXP. I've been asked before why not just go with an Intel part, such as the N100, so let's address this first and be done with it. First, if you check the ARC page, it says it has no embedded options available. This means that Intel gives absolutely no guarantees that this part will be produced for at least 7 years from the launch of the initial SKUs, which for this particular part I think it was Gen January 2023. Imagine we spend a year designing this board around this CPU and then Intel decides to stop manufacturing it a year or two later. Not good. But since I know logistics aren't as interesting, let's talk more about the practical technical reasons or differences. The N100 is a general purpose CPU and yes, on paper, if you just compare your standard specifications such as gigahertz, DDR5 memory support and PCIe lanes, then it wins hands down. It even has an integrated GPU and costs 25% less than our chosen CPU. However, we're not building a general purpose CPU, we're making a router, so a specialized device, which in theory could be powered by a general purpose CPU, uh, in fact many of them are, but as you'll hopefully soon learn throughout this video, a network optimized CPU is a much better choice. Why? Let's look at the block diagram for the layerscape. First, notice the networking elements, colored orange. You could say that this CPU has network cards built in, so you don't need much extra hardware for it. All you need is a $2 Phi chip which converts digital signals to analog and a connector be it an RJ45 or an SFP+. And this particular CPU, as you can see here, supports up to two 10 gigabit, one 2.5 and five gigabit interfaces. You see this sparse classified distribute block? Without going too much into details, this block is a part of what the folks at NXP called DPAA or Data Path Acceleration Architecture. What you need to know at this point is that the DPAA is like a traffic police. When packets arrive into the processor, DPAA decides how to handle them in a manner of speaking. For example, packets coming from the same source get sent to the same processor core because it already has all the necessary knowledge on how to process them in its cache and it's then much faster than if that packet would be processed by a randomly chosen core, which happens in a general purpose CPU. This particular chip also has a security engine. Packets get decrypted or encrypted on a hardware level, which is also much faster, but more importantly, a much more efficient way of dealing with encrypted traffic. I'll leave a link to the white paper down below, but what you should know at this point is that the CPU is highly network optimized compared to a general purpose one. And since we're looking at the block diagram, I might as well share this fun fact. Do you know what the differences are between a microcontroller and a microprocessor? This blue block called MMU. 
MMU stands for Memory Management Unit, and as the name suggests, it manages memory, or put it differently, RAM. Microprocessors need external memory in order to function, whereas microcontrollers do not. Our microprocessor also has what's called an IFC, or Integrated Flash Controller. If you've ever built a PC, you most likely used an M.2 SSD, which has two major parts. The first one is the actual NAND flash, you know, the chip on which the data is stored. And the second one is the controller that, well, controls that NAND flash by providing functions such as writing and reading, of course, monitoring read and write cycles, keeping track of bad blocks, and correcting some errors on the fly. It is the brain behind the storage, you could say. Well, that controller obviously adds cost to the device, and it's a cost that we're luckily spared, because in our case, it already comes built into the CPU. All we need to do when it comes to the actual PCB is route traces from the CPU to the NAND flash, and well, that's pretty much it. Obviously, I'm not trying to diminish the hard work that Alyash, my co-founder, will put into it, and we'll definitely make many more in-depth videos once we get there, but for this this high level conceptual overview, it's that simple. Unfortunately, this CPU cannot boot directly from the NAND flash, it needs some kind of storage attached to the quad SPI pins, which is why we'll use a 64 megabyte NOR flash chip, which will hold either a U-boot bootloader, but I also intend to test uh, UEFI as well, because the official documentation says that it is possible. Obviously, make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that. You know what? Since we're talking about pins, Let's actually look at the CPU pinout. At first, it might look a bit intimidating, uh, but all you have to do is squint your eyes a little and the picture actually becomes clearer. The central quarter mostly has green and red pins, or balls as they're called in our example, and these are connected to ground and power respectively. Then we have this wave of blue balls on the right, they all go to RAM. Purple ones on the top go to the NAND flash, and at the bottom part is pretty much filled with pink, dark pink, skin pink, and gray balls. The latter two are what are called RGMII, or Reduced Gigabit Media Independent Interface, or simply put, two gigabit ports. The former two, however, so the pink and the dark pink balls, represent two separate blocks of what is called a SERDIS. I won't go much into details, but for this video, what you need to know is that this SERDIS converts into either an array of Ethernet ports, PCIe lanes, or a SATA bus. Then what we're left with are pretty much just some specialized balls for either SD card support, which are these steel ones on the center left, uh, JTAG, which are these light olive ones towards the top, and the USB balls here on the top left. By the way, we plan for each of these components to get a dedicated video when we come to actually picking the parts and routing them on the actual PCB, and those videos will get much more in-depth, so excuse the kind of sloppy approach I'm taking right now. And yes, we have the PCB dimensions picked out as well. We knew from the start that we'd like to use one of the standard dimensions, not just for the thickness, which is 1.6 millimeters, but for the width and depth as well. Uh, the standard will go going with is Nano ATX, which is the smaller cousin of the Mini ITX that you probably know from the PC world. Nano ITX measures at 12 by 12 centimeters, which should give us enough surface real estate to be able to use all the features that I'm mentioning in this video. Why? Well, because each feature requires either a connector, a chip, or sometimes even several of them, connectors and chips that is, plus all the support components such as resistors, capacitors, and inductors. And obviously they all add up to the required surface area. Okay, and now time for some good news. I've talked about this project for the past couple of months without showing you anything concrete, and hopefully I don't need to explain much as to why that is, but I'll say it out loud anyway because someone in the comments called me a scammer. It's because when starting a new company, you first have to focus on, well, setting it up properly for the long run. I've said this many times before and I'll keep repeating it as long as I need to. A good plan is have the work done. 
and currently we are in the planning stage and I'd rather turn every stone right now when it costs next to nothing than to make a huge mistake that would turn out to be a very expensive one sometime down the line. So what is the good news? Well, we're almost there when it comes to the company logistics. We've signed the contract with the lawyers, I which I already mentioned in the previous video. We have onboarded an accountant. We have filed for incorporation in the state of Delaware. And once that is done, we're opening a bank account. But that's not actually what makes me super excited. What does is the fact that we've successfully onboarded a design studio called Cito Design. I've mentioned them in one of my previous videos, which you could check up here. And why is that such a big deal to me? Well, because two reasons. The first, they really know what they're doing. I might have designed the first iteration of the router on my own, but I'm no professional designer. So while this proof of concept turned out to be pretty great, if I do say so myself, there's probably a hundred details I might have missed in the process. Details that I'm sure that people over at Cito Design will address, discuss, and find solutions to. In fact, we already had a kickoff meeting, which brings me to the second reason I'm happy to have them on board. They agreed that I partially pay for their services in equity. This basically means they'll own a small piece of the company in return for the work that they'll produce. Now, some of you might be wondering, why would you do that? And the reasons actually aren't even that complicated. If they own some of the company, then it's in their best interest to produce the highest quality possible because they have skin in the game, so to speak. Uh, by the way, I'm not trying to say they wouldn't otherwise, they absolutely would. But you and I both know that the sense of ownership brings that extra 1% to the equation. And second, since we don't have to pay for their work, well, we do, but just to cover the costs, then this allows us to allocate more resources into the development of the hardware or to extend the runway. Runway in startup vocabulary is essentially how long a particular startup has before running out of money. And for us, extending it means we can hopefully develop product further than just the basic MVP. And this approach can significantly increase our chances to raise a second round, which we'll definitely need. And since we're talking about the design, I don't just mean the design of the device itself. While it is a big part, at least initially, CITO will provide much more, such as branding, design of the box it'll ship in, and most likely even a web design for the website once we get there. Okay, let's talk about deadlines, or more broadly, the timeline. Uh, we spoke with Alyash, my co-founder, you'll meet him soon, I promise, and we both feel confident we can have an early prototype prepared by the end of September 2024. It might not have all the features that we've set out to implement, but it should turn on and transfer network data between at least two ports. That'll be our MVP or minimum viable product. Ideally, we hope it will run OpenWRT, but for the MVP, we'll also settle for a bare Linux distribution such as Debian, or Unix distro such as FreeBSD. Cito Design has assured me that for what they need to do, seven months is more than enough. So if we don't have a fully functional product at that point yet, well, at least we'll have a great looking one. And that also counts for something, right? I mean, at least I'll be able to take some gorgeous photos for all of you to admire. By the way, since we're talking about photos, I do have a small photo studio with professional strobes and modifiers I use for my personal projects. Uh, so if you want me to make a small video tour of it, uh, please let me know down in the comments below and we'll have a look together. Anyway, last thing I should also mention is the actual start date. I mean, I've been working on this project for months now, but up until these days, it felt more like a hobby. I've been pitching the idea, making videos, researching components, and spent countless hours watching YouTube videos on PCB design, but the maker in me constantly felt like nothing was actually being made. That changes on 11th of March, 2024, which is the upcoming Monday. By then, Alyash will be back from his well-deserved holidays. We will hopefully have a company incorporated in Delaware and the bank account opened to receive the initial investment. And even if we do not, we'll start working on the PCB anyway and we'll sort out the legalities and logistics throughout the rest of the month. And yes, I haven't forgotten about some of you who have asked me why we decided to incorporate in Delaware. We'll address that in the follow-up video to the previous one, so make sure to click that subscribe button if you haven't yet. Okay, recap time. Processor, NXP Layerscape LS1046A, 8 gigabytes of discrete memory, most likely Micron, 64 gigabytes of discrete storage, also most likely Micron, 
two 10 gigabit SFP plus ports, three gigabit RJ45 ports, and three USB type PC ports. One for USB power delivery, one for UART, and one as a host device. We'll go with a 12 by 12 centimeter nano ITX PCB, 1.6 millimeter stick, most likely eight layers. It'll also feature a micro SD card slot, an M.2 slot, and a JTAG header, and despite the fact that we plan to cool it passively, a fan header, just in case. The device will be initially powered by OpenWRT, but in the long run, we aim to port OpenSense to it. It'll look great, and yes, it will fit into a rack. And finally, the two maybes. One gigabit port might become a 2.5 gigabit one, and one or more of the RJ45 ports may become PoE Plus ports. Let the work begin.